Welcome to the Little Bighorn Map Battle. This is part six in our series of six videos, and I am Bill Smith, your narrator for the series. And now let's get back to our maps and continue on with the unfolding events of June 25th, 1876. We have moved off to the left or north a little, and now we can see the northern end of the Little Bighorn Valley, as well as the Medicine Tail area and the entire Custer Battlefield. We can see the northern end of the Indian Village in the Little Bighorn Valley here. The Little Bighorn River flows right to left in a south to north direction. Ford Bay, or Medicine Tail Ford, is located at the northern end of the Indian Village. We have the open and broad ravine leading to Ford Bay, and this ravine is called Medicine Tail Cooley. Loose Ridge is the high ground north of Medicine Tail Cooley. Nye Cartwright Ridge is high ground north of Loose Ridge. Deep Cooley meets Medicine Tail Cooley at Ford B and affords an avenue of advance onto the Custer Battlefield. And now we have the main Custer Battlefield features. Here is Greasy Grass Ridge down by the river. Calhoun Cooley is the low ravine east of Greasy Grass Ridge. Calhoun Ridge is located north of Deep Cooley and actually connects Greasy Grass Ridge to Calhoun Hill. The Henryville sector is located at the upper reaches of Deep Cooley. Calhoun Hill is located here, north of the Henryville sector. Battle Ridge is in the middle of the map here. The Keogh sector is to the east of Battle Ridge. And Crazy Horse Ravine is to the east of the Keogh sector. Wooden Leg Hill is located to the east of Last Stand Hill. And Last Stand Hill is located at the northern end of Battle Ridge. Cemetery Ridge is the high ground west of Last Stand Hill and the South Scrimmage Line is the low area west of Last Stand Hill. Deep Ravine is located here down by the river. The flats are near the river as well, north of a small shallow ravine called Cemetery Ravine. And Ford D is located west of Cemetery Ridge at the Little Bighorn River. Now before we start the sixth set of maps, it must be noted that almost all of the time analysis comes from my own research. We really only have two solid times from the survivors to go on. Reno's men saw Custer up on the bluffs up to around 3.30 p.m., and we have Captain Weir, Lieutenant Hare, Captain Benteen, and other survivors witnessing the supposed end of Custer's battle and pulling off of Weir Point at 5.50 p.m. So we know that the Custer battle occurred between 3.30 and 5.50 p.m. Now, Indian testimony and archaeology provide us with the combatants' movements during the battle. So the trick was to get all of the movements within the time frame set by the eyewitness testimony and the archaeology. This I have done to the best of my ability, taking in the distances involved and the fact that the combatants were either riding on horses or were on foot. So now let's get back to the action and continue on with the Battle of the Little Bighorn. So now we have the Company F detail arriving on the map. They moved north, arriving on Loose Ridge at 3.45 p.m. They ascertain the position is safe and wave the Custer Battalion forward. So Custer exits Cedar Cooley and enters Medicine Tail Cooley at 3.48 p.m. Halting in the ravine, Custer formulates a battle plan. At 3.50 p.m., Boston Custer arrives and links up with his brothers and nephew. Now, Boston brings valuable information with him. He tells the general that the pack train is on the back trail moving toward the battlefield. Benteen has also returned to the back trail and is close to the pack train and is likewise moving toward the battlefield. So Custer now knows that both the pack train and Benteen are closer than originally thought. Their arrival, therefore, should be sooner than expected. Boston also tells the general that he has passed both Knipe and Martini. Custer now knows that the couriers would make it through to deliver their messages. Lastly, Boston has ridden down Reno Creek and along the bluffs alone and had not been killed or seen any Indians up close. Custer now knew that the back trail was free of Indians, thus allowing for a safe and quick return of the recalled units. So up to this point, everything looks pretty good. With all this information, Custer reforms his battle plan. Medicine Tail Cooley has a clear avenue of advance, not only to the Little Bighorn River, but to the northern end of the Indian village as well. The obvious maneuver is to go down to the ford, observe the situation, and then take things from there. Remember that Custer is acting on the fly on terrain that he is unfamiliar with, and the ever-changing event is fluid. A forward move is necessary, but all of the bases have to be covered as well. It is not certain what Custer will find at the ford once he gets there. In Scenario 1, the village may be full of non-combatants. If this is the case, then Custer will cross the river and strike the village. 
However, in Scenario 2, the village may be completely deserted. There is a very real possibility that the non-combatants have fled further to the north. In this scenario, Custer would move farther north after the women and children. But Custer has no knowledge of the terrain to the north of them. To secure a safe and possible rendezvous point to the north of Medicine Tail Cooley, Custer at 3.55 p.m. once again sends the Company F detail off to locate good ground to the north. The detail departs Loose Ridge, rides over Nye Cartwright Ridge, and arrives on Calhoun Hill, which is north of Medicine Tail Cooley, at 4.13 p.m. Custer decides to keep the battalion divided into its two wings. The recalled units could arrive at any time, and they will need to locate the Custer battalion once in the area. Custer decides to send Captain Miles Walter Keogh's three-company right wing up to Loose Ridge to act as a facilitation marker for Benteen and possibly McDougal as well. It is clear that the right wing has been given the passive support assignment, and because of this, any of its future deployments would be dictated by the more aggressive left wing movements. As for the left wing, it would move down Medicine Tail Cooley to Ford B and assess the situation there. What Custer sees at the northern end of the Indian village will dictate his next move. So around 4 p.m., the wings separate. Keogh, commanding the right wing, heads to Loose Ridge, while the left wing, commanded by Captain George W. Yates, with the headquarters staff attached, starts down Medicine Tail Cooley toward Ford B. The right wing reaches Loose Ridge at 4.03 p.m. Captain Keogh immediately places his Company I and 2nd Lieutenant Henry Moore Harrington's Company C in reserve while deploying 1st Lieutenant James Calhoun's Company L in a south-facing skirmish line. The left wing continues down Medicine Tail Cooley. As the wing nears the Little Bighorn River, it divides again. Captain George W. Yates's Company F, along with the headquarters staff, move off to the north and take positions up on Butler Ridge. This high ground affords a good view of the northern end of the Indian village, which is just across the river. Company E, under 1st Lieutenant Algernon Emery Smith, moves down to the flat at Ford B, arriving there at 4.08 p.m. There are a handful of warriors down at the ford in the northern end of the Indian village. They fire at Company E, which is just across the river. While this sniping is going on, Custer up on Butler Ridge surveys the northern end of the Indian village. He only sees warriors. The village appears to be deserted. The non-combatants have already fled farther to the north. Due to this situation, there is no reason to cross the river and enter the village. The primary target, the women and children, have to be captured. Custer decides to move north and reunite the entire battalion at the pre-designated point, Calhoun Hill. Signaling Company E, the left wing at 4.13 p.m. begins to move northeast up Deep Cooley towards Calhoun Hill. On Loose Ridge to the east, Captain Keogh's right wing has been engaging warriors that have come north from Reno Hill. The Indians occupy the northern end of the bluffs as well as positions in Cedar Cooley. Company L, commanded by 1st Lieutenant James Calhoun, has fired several volleys at the Indian positions, keeping them at bay. It is this organized firing that the survivors heard on Reno Hill. This was also the same firing that both Reno and Benteen said they'd never heard and ignored. While sniping at the Indians, Captain Keogh continues to observe the left wing down at the ford. Upon seeing the left wing pull back from the ford at 4.13 p.m., Keogh mounts Company L, and the entire wing begins to move north for the pre-designated rendezvous point. At 4.18 p.m., the right wing reaches Nycart Right Ridge, and while mounted, fires on the warriors that have crossed Ford Bay and were pursuing the left wing as it moved up Deep Cooley. Warriors fire back, and this results in the 1st Custer Battalion fatality. Private John Duggan of Company L is killed just north of Nycart Right Ridge. The left wing reaches Calhoun Hill at 4.28 p.m. The right wing arrives on Calhoun Hill five minutes later at 4.33 p.m. Four of the five companies position themselves on top of the hill. Captain Miles Keogh deploys 1st Lieutenant James Calhoun's Company L in a skirmish line in the Henryville sector south of Calhoun Hill. From there, Company L fires at warriors positioned in Lower Deep Cooley. From atop Calhoun Hill, General Custer can see the exodus from the village. The women and children are still fleeing north along the river. Custer decides to repeat the same maneuver he had just completed minutes earlier in Medicine Tail Cooley. The right wing under Captain Keogh will remain at Calhoun Hill and pin down the warrior force in their front. Keogh's wing will also act as a facilitation point for the recalled units, Benteen and possibly McDougal. While the right wing is once again assigned the passive support assignment, the left wing is given the more aggressive assignment of tracking the non-combatants and locating a ford to cross the river. At 4.35 p.m., the left wing and the headquarters staff departs Calhoun Hill and moves north on the eastern side of Battle Ridge. When the left wing departs Calhoun Hill, Captain Keogh, per tactics, redeploys the right wing. 
First Lieutenant James Calhoun's Company L is extricated from its skirmish line in the Henryville sector and redeployed in a skirmish line on Calhoun Hill itself. The new line faces south, where it can properly deal with the warriors coming from the south, as well as warriors to the southwest in Deep Cooley. Just like on Loose Ridge earlier, Captain Keogh places Company C and I in reserve in a low-lying area northeast of Calhoun Hill, and the Company L-led horses are placed in the Calhoun Hill retreat draw north of the hill for their protection. The left wing continues north, and as it nears Last Stand Hill, it encounters two groups of warriors led by Wolf's Tooth and Bigfoot. Now these warriors had been off to the north hunting and were unaware of any attack on the Indian village. Upon seeing the left wing, they move forward and fire into the van of the soldiers. The left wing moves on without concern. They move over Cemetery Ridge and down to the Ford D area. While this is going on, the van of the warriors returning from the valley fight are beginning to arrive. They spot the right wing deployed on Calhoun Hill and mistakenly conclude that they are the new threat to the village. Most of these warriors are unaware of the left wing, which is farther to the north and presently out of sight. The warriors cross the river at Ford B and move up Deep Cooley. Others cross the river and take up positions on Greasy Grass Ridge, north of Deep Cooley. The left wing reaches 4D at 4.45 p.m. From the high bank east of the river, Custer can see the total exodus from the village. Thousands of women and children and elders are just across the river, massed in a female wiki-up camp north of the main village. A few warriors, mainly Cheyenne, are also present, and they spot the soldiers. They fire at the soldiers, killing the civilian Mark Kellogg, the newspaper correspondent from the Bismarck Tribune. As the two groups snipe at each other, it becomes clear to Custer that there is no way he can cross and capture this many people. The left wing had a total of 82 men in it. More men would be needed to do the job. Benteen's arrival is now more important than ever. Once the captain arrived, Custer would have eight companies and 330 men, enough soldiers to capture at least a large portion, if not all, of the non-combatants currently in the 4D area. So at this point, things look pretty good. The prime target of the soldiers is close and virtually unprotected. Major Reno has done his job and was keeping the bulk of the warrior force occupied. Keogh's right wing up on Calhoun Hill was likewise taking care of any warriors in the northern battle area. All of this while acting as a facilitation marker for Captain Benteen's battalion, which presumably would be arriving at any minute. Custer decides to pull back from 4D and redeploy on higher ground and wait for Benteen's arrival. The wing turns and rides east, arriving at a position on Low Cemetery Ridge at 4.55 p.m. Now while Custer has been at 4D, a large number of warriors has arrived on the battlefield. Warriors use 4D as their main crossing point and use Deep Cooley as an avenue of advance on the right wing positioned on Calhoun Hill. Warriors occupy Greasy Grass Ridge, Calhoun Cooley, and Calhoun Ridge west of Calhoun Hill. Warriors also occupy Deep Cooley and the Henryville sector south of Calhoun Hill. To the east, warriors are positioned in Crazy Horse Ravine. At this point, many of these warriors are out of sight as they creep through the high grass and the low-lying terrain. Slowly, they surround the right-wing position and snipe at the Calhoun Hill skirmish line. First Lieutenant Calhoun continues to fire in a calm and cool manner. The skirmish line is stable, the position is safe, and commands all of the ground surrounding it. Nothing threatening nooms at this point. Since the majority of the warriors are positioned in low-lying areas, they don't notice the left wing's return from Ford D. Warriors positioned on high ground like Greasy Grass Ridge and Calhoun Ridge do spot the left wing when it appears on Cemetery Ridge. This must have been a real shock to the warriors. Thinking that the right wing was the main soldier force, the warriors had completely failed to identify soldiers farther north and closer to the non-combatants. The left wing posed a real threat and had to be dealt with. As word filters across the battlefield, the warriors move north to counter the new threat. The left wing on Low Cemetery Ridge snipes at warriors positioned in Deep Ravine, Cemetery Ravine, and the Flats. The warrior presence continues to grow. Custer decides to make an offensive maneuver against these warriors, and at 5 p.m. the left wing moves off of Low Cemetery Ridge and rides down into the area of Cemetery Ravine and the Flats. This maneuver scatters warriors and many fall back toward Deep Ravine. The left wing then turns to the left, crossing Cemetery Ravine and taking up positions in the South Scrimmage Line Deep Ravine Basin. The left wing is only in this new position for a few minutes before another division is made. Custer sends 1st Lieutenant Algernon Emery Smith's Company E up to a position on High Cemetery Ridge. Company E reaches the ridge at 5.05 p.m., forming a skirmish line facing to the south to confront warriors still in the Flats area and in Deep Ravine. Company F, commanded by Captain George W. Yates, remains with the headquarters staff in the South Skirmish Line Deep Ravine Basin. 
Now, this is the final disposition of Custer's battalion before disaster strikes. Per tactics, the right wing is Company L in a skirmish line on Calhoun Hill, while Company C and I remain in reserve in the low-lying Keogh sector east of Battle Ridge. The left wing has Company E in a skirmish line on Cemetery Ridge, while Company F and the headquarters staff remain in reserve in the low-lying South Skirmish Line Deep Ravine Basin. Nothing threatening loomed. The Custer Battalion was in an offensive posture up to this point in the battle. The Warriors had superior numbers, but as of yet had failed to assault the soldier position. The cavalry's tactics had so far kept the Warriors at bay. Only two companies were needed to deal with the Warriors, while the other three companies could remain in reserve. Under such favorable conditions, the Custer Battalion could afford to sit and wait for the recalled units, and Custer and his men did just that. Eventually, the favorable situation changed. The warrior presence in Calhoun Cooley began to threaten the right flank of the Company L skirmish line on Calhoun Hill. Captain Miles W. Keogh, the right wing commander, decided to drive the warriors to the west of Calhoun Hill back and away from the Calhoun Hill skirmish line. Captain Keogh, at 5.05 p.m., sends 2nd Lieutenant Henry Moore Harrington's Company C out of the reserve east of Battle Ridge, over the ridge, and into Calhoun Cooley. This maneuver scatters the warriors in the Calhoun Cooley sector. Most flee to Greasy Grass Ridge, or down Calhoun Cooley, towards its junction with Deep Ravine. Company C deploys on a small ridge east of the Cooley, forming a skirmish line with an intent to hold the area. Unfortunately for the soldiers, Company C's new position breaks range which was the most important advantage the cavalry needed to keep. Forcing the warriors to fight at a distance gave the cavalry all the advantages. Allowing the warriors to get close would profoundly change the aspect of the battle. Company C was close and some 80 feet below the warriors positioned on nearby Greasy Grass Ridge. At 5.10 p.m., the warriors, Chief Lame White Man, Contrary Belly, Runs the Enemy, Turtle Rib, Comes in Sight, and others, counterattack off the ridge while other warriors move up Calhoun Cooley and flank the Company C skirmish line on the right. Four soldiers are killed in this action, and since the company held their horses on the skirmish line, most are lost and run wild across the battlefield. With the mobility of the company compromised, not to mention the loss of ammunition as it runs off with the horses, the soldiers in Company C are forced to flee on foot. They retreat to Calhoun Ridge and at 5.15 p.m. attempt to form a skirmish line at the southern end of the ridge. This position is quickly smashed, resulting in seven more soldiers falling. Two of the three Company C sergeants, August Finkel and Jeremiah Finley, are among the soldiers that are killed in this action. The survivors of the company flee in confusion east up Calhoun Ridge, where eight more men fall. So up to this point, over half of the company has been wiped out. At this point, Company L still has a stable skirmish line on Calhoun Hill. The line has continued to snipe with warriors to the south in Deep Cooley and in the Henryville sector. The collapse and flight of Company C, however, has completely changed the situation. At 5.15 p.m., First Lieutenant James Calhoun decides to shift his south-facing skirmish line to a west-facing skirmish line, so the entire company wheels back to the right, not only to cover the Company C retreat, but also to deal with the greater warrior threat coming from the west. The maneuver has an unexpected result, though. The survivors of Company C reach the safety of Calhoun Hill, and the warriors to the west are halted by the new skirmish line. But the new skirmish line no longer directly opposes the warriors to the south of Calhoun Hill. At 5.20 p.m., these warriors move up close in the Henryville sector and begin to fire into the exposed left flank of the Company L skirmish line. This Indian fire results in four soldiers killed, and the left flank of the line is under serious duress. It is around this time that First Lieutenant Calhoun sends orders to plunder men from the horse holders in the Calhoun Hill retreat draw, and possibly news of the situation on the hill was sent to Captain Keogh as well. Adding a couple men from the horse holders apparently proved ineffective. The warriors to the west moved in closer to Calhoun Hill, and the skirmish line took heavy fire from the front and the left. The line collapsed, and a group of soldiers bunched in a circle in the middle of the hill before fleeing north. Order was never restored. The Indians moved closer as the soldiers gave way. It was around this time that a warrior named Yellow Nose captured the Company L Guidon placed on the southern sector of the hill. As the soldiers retreated, eight more men are killed on the hill, including both Company L officers, 1st Lieutenant James Calhoun and 2nd Lieutenant John Jordan Crittenden. The Indians push forward, finding the horse holders in the Calhoun Hill retreat draw. Indian testimony states, Soldiers were each holding more than the allotted three horses that tactics prescribed, strong evidence that men had been raided from the horse holders and brought to the line for reinforcement. The horse holders were easy targets, and five more soldiers, including Private John Graham of Company L, was killed in the Calhoun Hill retreat draw. 
Up to this point, the cavalry had lost 38 men, and two of the three right-wing companies were utterly destroyed. Company C had started the battle with 36 men, but by the time of the loss of Calhoun Hill, 19 of its soldiers had fallen, including two of its three sergeants. Company L had began the battle with 44 men, but had lost 17, including both its officers. Both companies flee north toward the only stable military unit in the area, Captain Keogh's Company I. The warriors also took casualties. The general census is that 12 warriors died in the fighting against Calhoun Ridge and Calhoun Hill. No kill sites have been marked for warriors in this area, but we do have a list of Indian killed and can speculate where some of these warriors died. One unknown warrior was seen with his jaw shot off. This man was delirious, kept running around and falling down, getting back up, falling down again. The warriors were horrified at this sight. Clearly this warrior did not survive such a wound. The warrior's bad light hair, cloud man, elk bear, kill him, lone dog, plenty lice, guts, Red Face and Young Skunk were all on the list of killed and were most likely killed while fighting against the Calhoun positions. Two other unknowns also died, giving researchers the 12 confirmed killed at this point. Now the eight remaining confirmed killed on the Custer battlefield all have markers, so this eliminates them from the Calhoun Ridge and Calhoun Hill sectors. Just when the Custer Battalion thought things couldn't get any worse, the soldiers are hit by a devastating double blow. The first of these two attacks comes from the north. While the right wing was being driven back across Calhoun Ridge and Calhoun Hill, the left wing had continued to hold a stable position up on Cemetery Ridge. Up to this point, the Company E skirmish line has kept the warriors at bay, but things are about to change. A large number of young Cheyenne suicide warriors have been gathering to the north of the Cemetery Ridge sector. Their tactic is simple, launch an assault on the ridge and destroy the soldier position. At 5.25 p.m., the Cheyenne suicide warrior attack begins. It is pretty clear that Company E was not prepared for this attack. Maybe the soldiers were busy concentrating on the warrior force in Deep Ravine and the flat sectors, or perhaps they were distracted by the sudden reversal along Calhoun Ridge. Either way, the warriors climb the ridge and charge into the skirmish line, breaking it in two pieces. This action scatters many of the Company E horses as they were being held on the line with the soldiers. During the Cemetery Ridge fighting, six soldiers are killed, and the warriors lose one confirmed killed, a warrior named Cut Belly. The suicide warriors, after breaking the skirmish line, continue moving southeast toward Battle Ridge. Company E, now almost completely without mobility, pulls off of Cemetery Ridge and reunites with Company F and the headquarters staff in the South Skirmish Line Deep Ravine Basin. For now, the left wing is granted a temporary reprieve. To the south, the second blow is about to fall on the right wing. Captain Keogh's Company I, still in reserve, accepts the 44 survivors from Company C and L. Indians surround the soldiers on three sides. To the west, along Battle Ridge, Lame White Man comes in sight, runs the enemy, Contrary Belly, Turtle Rib, Crow King, and others prepare to attack. To the south at Calhoun Hill, Gall, Yellow Nose, and other warriors continue to loot the dead and finish off the wounded. To the east, in a shallow ravine, Crazy Horse, White Bull, and others decide to launch an attack immediately. At 5.25 p.m., they pour out of the ravine, catching Company I still in reserve. Lame White Man and the others charge down Battle Ridge from the west. Gaul and other warriors from Calhoun Hill join the attack. The Indian attack is devastating. Since Company I is in reserve, every soldier is still mounted and not ready for an attack. In a stroke of misfortune, Captain Keogh is shot through the leg at the beginning of the attack. The bullet crushes his knee and travels into his horse, Comanche. The horse takes several more hits, and Keo is unsaddled and incapacitated. Keo's non-commissioned staff surrounds their commander in an attempt to protect him. Among them are First Sergeant Edwin Bobo of Company C, Sergeant James Boussard, Trumpeter John Patton, Sergeant Frank Varden, and Corporal John Wild of Company I. Private Willis Wright of Company C also was involved in the defense. The small cluster of men were surrounded and killed. Hand-to-hand -hand combat was described by the warriors, and they also said that the soldiers threw away their carbines in favor for their Colt pistols. The massive Indian attack resulting in the loss of the Company I and Battalion Commander, not to mention some 24 other soldiers, was clearly enough to plunge the remaining 56 survivors into chaos. The soldiers fled north, mostly on the eastern side of Battle Ridge, but some soldiers did crest Battle Ridge, possibly in an attempt to reach the safety of the left wing, which at this time was still positioned in the South Skirmish Line Deep Ravine Basin. These men, however, experienced another horrifying surprise. 
As they crested Battle Ridge, they ran headlong into the Cheyenne suicide warriors that had minutes earlier broken the Company E skirmish line on Cemetery Ridge. Soldiers and warriors were tangled in a mass, resulting in ten more soldiers killed. Farther down the slope, on the east side of Battle Ridge, First Lieutenant James Ezekiel Porter, the Company I executive officer, gathered a dozen men and possibly attempted to reverse the earlier setbacks. But the attempt failed, resulting in the deaths of Porter and a dozen more men. During the fighting along Battle Ridge, the warriors suffered two confirmed killed. Chief Lame White Man was shot in the Keogh sector. He crossed Battle Ridge and collapsed and died on the western slope. Another warrior, Bear with Horns, was likewise killed on Battle Ridge, not far from where Lame White Man had fallen. From their position in the South Greenwich Line Deep Ravine Basin, Custer and everyone in the left wing, despite not having a direct view, can clearly see something serious is happening on the other side of Battle Ridge. At 5.30 p.m., Custer decides to move the left wing to higher ground to see what the situation is. The right wing is clearly in retreat and needs assistance. Custer chooses the best high ground he can find for the rendezvous, Last Stand Hill. Company F and the headquarters staff still has their horses, so they race up the Last Stand Hill, reaching the top at 5.32 p.m. Company E, without horses, lags behind, arriving on the lower western slope of the hill at 5.35 p.m. From his vantage point on top of Last Stand Hill, Custer can see the complete reality of the situation. The right wing has been virtually destroyed. Soldiers flee with warriors in hot pursuit. Custer and his men fire at the warriors, allowing 20 survivors on the right wing to reach the temporary safety of the hill, but 15 other soldiers are not as lucky as they are cut down while trying to reach Last Stand Hill. A quick head count gives Custer around 95 men on the hill. Most don't have horses, and abandoning these men is not an option. The recalled units still were nowhere in sight, but Custer must have decided to defend the hill. Everyone prepared for defense. The offensive was over, and now the situation had become a fight for life and death. Many headquarters personnel, along with some right-wing survivors, positioned themselves on top of Last Stand Hill, ready to deal with Indian threats coming from the south and east. Company F, under Captain George Yates, was positioned on the upper western slope of the hill, while First Lieutenant Algernon Emery Smith's Company E held the lower western slope of the hill. By 5.35, the warriors surround the hill and begin to fire on the soldier position. There is no cover for the soldiers on the hill, so they make a difficult decision and shoot their horses to use them as breastworks. Thirty-nine horses are shot on the hill, providing the soldiers with cover. The battle continues to rage. It is at this point that Custer makes his last offensive maneuver of the battle. Assistance is clearly needed. Custer orders the horseless Company E to charge off Last Stand Hill toward the South Skirmish Line Deep Ravine Basin in an attempt to drive away warriors in that area. Once this is complete, Custer will send seven men who still have horses south to find help. The command will attempt to hold out until the recalled units arrive. Once the riders are away, Company E will pull back to the hill and continue to defend the southern portion of Last Stand Hill. Custer has an immediate problem with this plan. The commander of Company E, Custer's good friend, First Lieutenant Algernon Emery Smith, has been wounded and is unable to lead the attack. That means that the command falls to the Company E executive officer, Second Lieutenant James Garland Sturgis, who just so happens to be the son of the commander of the 7th Cavalry, Colonel Samuel D. Sturgis. At 5.40 p.m., Company E deploys off of Last Stand Hill, driving into the South Skirmish Line Deep Ravine Basin. This scatters the warriors in the area, opening up a corridor of escape for the seven riders. The riders take off. Possibly among them are First Sergeant James Butler of Company L, Corporal John Foley of Company C, and Trumpeter Henry C. Dose from headquarters attached as orderly to Custer. With the riders away, Company E should have returned to the hill as ordered, but something prevented this. Either the company refused to return to the hill, or an Indian counterattack prevented the return. Either way, 29 soldiers never returned to the hill and instead moved forward and fled into Deep Ravine. Their fate was now all but sealed. The riders fared little better. Four of the seven were shot down before reaching Calhoun Ridge. Trumpeter Dose was killed in Deep Cooley and Corporal Foley shot himself in the head near Ford B. First Sergeant James Butler was unhorsed on the ridge that now bears his name. Despite this, per Indian testimony, he put up a good fight firing at warriors until he was overwhelmed. By 5.45 p.m., the situation up on Last Stand Hill was critical. A warrior assault on the hill had been postponed due to the fire coming from the soldiers. A warrior wearing a war bonnet was shot in the head and killed on Wooden Leg Hill east of Last Stand Hill. The warrior's closed hand and limber bones were shot and killed north of Last Stand Hill, and the warrior Black Wasichu was wounded west of Last Stand Hill and later died. 
Up to this point, Custer still had 59 men on the hill. The dead horses were protecting the soldiers well from the Indian fire. The warriors had to eliminate this advantage and did so by lobbing hundreds of arrows into the soldier position. The raining of arrows began to thin out the group and allowed for a less costly Indian assault on the hill. As the warriors moved in, at least 17 soldiers attempted to escape the hill. Three notable examples of this came from headquarters. Regimental Sergeant Major William H. Shero fled the ring before being killed north of Last Stand Hill. Sergeant Robert H. Hughes, who carried Custer's personal battle flag into the fight, fled to the southwest and died on the South Skirmish Line. The civilian and Crow Scout interpreter Mitch Boyer likewise fled to the South Skirmish Line, dying on its upper segment. Another possible escape attempt was made by Private Weston Harrington of Company L. Harrington was found at the beginning of the South Skirmish Line, just west of Last Stand Hill. The remaining 42 men on Last Stand Hill continued to resist until overwhelmed. The warriors raced in from all sides, killing soldiers with guns, arrows, war clubs, and hatchets. By 5.50 p.m., the fighting on the hill is all over. The wounded are dispatched and the dead are looted. On top of the hill are General George Armstrong Custer, Captain Tom Custer, aide-de-camp to his brother, Chief Trumpeter Henry Voss of the headquarters staff, the regimental color bearer, Sergeant John Vickery of Company F, regimental adjutant, First Lieutenant William Winter Cook of headquarters, First Lieutenant Algernon Emery Smith of Company E, as well as Privates Edward C. Driscoll and John Parker of Company I, and Private Charles McCarthy of Company L. Down the western slope of the hill lay Captain George W. Yates and 2nd Lieutenant William Van Wick Riley of Company F, 1st Lieutenant and Regimental Surgeon George Edwin Lord and his hospital orderly, Corporal John J. Callahan of Company K, Corporal William Teeman and Private Gustave Klein of Company F, Private Thomas Tweed of Company L, and Private Ignat Stungowitz of Company C. At the western base of the hill lie two civilians, 27-year-old Boston Custer and 19-year-old Harry Armstrong Reed. While the looting and mutilation continued on Last Stand Hill, the last of Custer's troops were being killed in Deep Ravine to the southwest. The men were desperately trying to hide in the underbrush, while others fled down the ravine toward the river. Warriors positioned in the lower ravine were able to kill Sergeant John S. Ogden of Company E near the river. Private William Brown of Company F managed to cross the river at Deep Ravine, only to be killed on the west bank. The remaining soldiers retreated back up Deep Ravine. As they did so, they were picked off one by one by warriors standing on both sides of the ravine. Confirmed soldiers killed in the ravine are Private Timothy Donnelly of Company F, Private Francis Hughes of Company L, Sergeant Frederick Holmeyer, Corporals Thomas Hagen and Albert Meyer, and Privates William Huber, Richard Farrell, and William H. Reese of Company E. It was during the final minutes of fighting in and around Deep Ravine that the warriors suffered their last confirmed fatality. The warrior Noisy Walking was shot near to the ravine, and he died west of Battle Ridge. The guns fell silent at 5.55 p.m. Custer and his entire battalion had been completely annihilated. Company C, E, F, I, L, and the headquarters staff, 211 officers, soldiers, and civilians now lie scattered across the battlefield, most stripped naked and cut up in accordance with Native American beliefs. The warriors lose a confirmed 20 killed with what is later described as a great many wounded. Even before the last soldiers had been killed, many warriors noticed the forward movement of Captain Thomas Weir toward the Custer battlefield. Warriors begin to filter back south to deal with this new threat. As Weir, Benteen, and others witness the end of the Custer battle, more and more warriors begin to move on Weir Point. This prompts the soldiers to return to Reno Hill. And that will conclude the Little Bighorn Map Battle documentary. I would like to close with a marker map showing the final disposition of Custer's troops as well as the Indians that were killed in the battle. The blue dots represent soldiers and the red dots represent known warrior kill sites. Now the map itself is not 100% accurate, but it does give us an overall impression of the kill site locations on the battlefield. I would also like to thank all of you for watching. I hope you enjoyed the documentary and you found it educational. So until next time, thank you and have a good day.